Well, with the number of COVID vaccines poised to grow, so is the possibility that we perhaps might have a choice. So if a choice becomes a reality, and it is hard for me to believe that we'll be there, but that would be fantastic. I would love to be in a spot where we could have a choice. Which vaccine do you want? Well, Bloomberg medical science reporter Michelle Cortez wrote about this today and joins me now from Minneapolis. Michelle, uh, thanks so much for being here. Look, the thought of us getting to choose our vaccine is absolutely appealing, given what we saw from Johnson & Johnson and Novavax last week. Is this something that you think could be likely in the near future? Well, we are already seeing that in the UK. Over there, they do have access to the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Some people are getting offered one and they're wondering if they should wait. They're getting offered the AstraZeneca one, which has a lower efficacy rate, and they're wondering if they should wait and mm. hope to get access to the Pfizer one. In the United States, with the data coming out just last week from Johnson & Johnson and Novavax, absolutely we are going to, in the next couple of weeks, start getting additional vaccines coming online. And people will likely be given different vaccinations here in the U.S. So when the efficacy numbers are different and there are more than one available, it's something that people are going to start comparing, just okay. like we compare everything else. Yeah, well, let's talk about that. And I think because um, there's been a lot of, uh, I think, questions about what these numbers really mean and the point of a vaccine. And in, in your story, you do a fantastic job of laying it out what the point of a vaccine is, right? It's not for treating an, an illness, as you write. It's like insurance. Um, so, so take us through why that 66% figure coming from Johnson & Johnson last week versus the uh, more than 90% from the mRNA vaccines that are available right now um, shouldn't dissuade us. Right. Well, the way to think about it is vaccines are not to treat an, an illness. You should think about it more as an insurance policy, as if it was something for car insurance, right? You don't ever want to use your car insurance. You don't ever want to get in an accident and all the other things that could come along with that. But you want to have car insurance and you want, more importantly, everyone else to have car insurance, especially if they're high risk of getting in an accident. You really want those people to have the best insurance so that if they're hitting other people or getting hit, they're going to get the most benefit from it. That's the way I think about these vaccines as well. I mean, honestly, if you think about it, what I would like to happen is for all of the people who are going to get exposed to coronavirus, for all of them to be vaccinated and me to not need a shot in my arm at all, right? I would like that virus to just go away entirely. Um, but of course, we're not going to get to that point. So how is the best way for all of us to get there? And the best way for us to get there is for the highest risk people. That means the people who are most likely to get in contact with the virus, mm. become infected and pass it to other people. And those people who are most likely to be really seriously injured, end up in the hospital and perhaps dying. I want all of those people to get the vaccine first because that's going to lower my risk that that virus continues to circulate in my community and expose me and my loved ones to but, it. But what about, Michelle, to, to somebody who says, wait a second, there are these new strains that are emerging. We, we don't know how these different vaccines deal with these new strains yet. Um, give us some insight there, because I think there is a lot of confusion about which vaccines work better against emerging strains and variants. The most important thing for everyone to know about the emerging strains is that all of the vaccines that we have so far have at least minimal protection against those new strains. Even the most reduced efficacy rate we're seeing comes on that South African strain, and we're seeing 57% efficacy. So in that case, you're still getting a benefit. It's still higher than the levels that Dr. Fauci and others had said we would need to get in order for a vaccine to be approved in the United States. So you are absolutely getting protection. There's also very fascinating data out there that suggests that getting vaccinated against almost any virus might lend you some protection. It can boost up your immune system and offer you some protection against hmm. coronavirus. Hmm. Not only that, we don't know what strains are circulating in any particular country right now. Certainly, in the United States, most of the virus that we have out there is not these new variant strains from the UK, South Africa, and Brazil. So what we really want is to get everyone as much protection as we can. Then with these new mRNA vaccines, we can boost them up pretty quickly. They are already looking to adjust their manufacturing to take into account some of these new strains. And then we might be able to come back to people with a much lower dose 
and basically give you a booster that protects you against those specific variants. But if we get everybody vaccinated with a baseline level of protection, then it'll be easier to come back with a lower dose of something more targeted should we get another strain really circulating widely in the U.S. Uh, look, I mean, I, I really hope we would be able to get to that point where we were even thinking about boosters. But given that we're, you know, between 1.3 and perhaps 1.7 million shots per day, we're, we're certainly, I think, a, a long way off from that. Um, Michelle, what, what, is, what is the relationship between somebody who had COVID months ago, um, perhaps early on in the pandemic, and then their potential exposure or susceptibility to one of these new strains? Well, it's a great question, and, and there's two elements to that. Number one is if you've gotten a, an early wild type, the original uh, strain of the virus, could you become infected again with the novel variants that are emerging? There's also the question of how long does any of your level of immunity last? If you were infected in February or March, could you get have, has your immunity waned and could you get infected with the exact same strain again? We don't know the answer to either one of those questions, to be honest. It, it, experts do believe that if you've been previously infected or vaccinated, that you would have a milder case if you were exposed again. But again, we don't know definitively that that is the case. So at this point, it's a little bit of a wing and a prayer. Bloomberg's Michelle Cortez. Michelle, thank you, as always, for your time. We really appreciate it.